Good morning, Christ Covenant. Uh, it's good to be with you again this week. After last week doing Sunday school with you, this week I was asked again uh, to spend some time with you by Dr. Blair Smith. And so I wanted to talk with you about uh, children in corporate worship, uh, including our children in corporate worship. What I want to do uh, this morning with you is just spend a little time thinking about that idea together and talking about some of the blessings and benefits of it. And then I want to give you uh, some practical advice about how to do that. Uh, this is something that the church uh, has done for ages. I think uh, more recently uh, with the Sunday school movement in uh, the 1800s, uh, which eventually became something that was happening uh, on Sundays during worship. Uh, it is something that has fallen on hard times, and I think it's one of the great benefits that uh, we can give our children, and one of the great benefits that the church as a whole can enjoy together by having our children in corporate worship. So I want to talk about that this morning, but let me pray for us, and before we launch into it, let's pray together. Our Father, we are thankful for your goodness to us, reminded of that as we reflect upon worship this morning together, as we think upon the gift of your word, the gift of the sacraments, the gift of prayer. We think about it as we think about the gift of our children and the children that have been blessed to our congregation, to our families. We pray that we would set a good example before them, we would train them well in the things of you, and that we would do all that we could, and that all that we can, to minister to their souls effectively uh, for their good and for your glory. We pray this in the strong name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and our God. Amen. It was a number of years ago, I was uh, had a Sunday off, and as a Pass through when you get a Sunday off, uh, they are rare. And so I like to try and visit another church and just kind of see what they're doing and, and sit under a different preacher preaching the word. And it's a number of years ago when my children were smaller and we had that Sunday off. And I remember we walked in and there were two very friendly people standing at the doors ready to welcome us into the service. And as I was beginning to walk in with my children behind me, uh, one of the friendly individuals said with a smile, we have children's classes down the hall. Uh, you might want to take them down there. And I said, no, I said, they're going to go into the service with me. Thank you, though, for that. Uh, so we sat down and I looked at the bulletin that they had put into my hand as we walked into the sanctuary. And in bold letters, at the bottom of the page, uh, it said, our services are not for children. There are age-appropriate classes in the children's wing. Please take your children there. In bold letters on the bulletin. Just kind of a bold declaration that the children weren't wanted in their services. I was reflecting upon that as the service was just beginning and uh, a couple of people got up to give announcements at the church and they walked through a series of announcements and they said, our big announcement that we have prepped you for over these past three or four weeks. And it was a big, a big to do. Uh, they said, is this, is that we are starting an entire year where we are going to focus on what it means to be a Christian parent. And I thought the disconnect, there's a disconnect here. To spend the year focusing on how to be an effective Christian parent, wonderful, love it. Uh, and yet in the bulletins, you're stating that children aren't welcome in this most important moment in the corporate life of the church, this week in and week out, gathering together as the body of Christ, as a local church, worshiping or living Christ. There's a disconnect. One of the 
best ways that you and I can parent our covenant children is to bring them week in and week out to corporate worship. They are to be included in what is the high point, the apex of our community life together. We talked about this last week. What happens when the body of Christ or when the church gathers together, it worships. This is what it does. And so this is the great thing that we do together as a community and to think that we would exclude part of our community from this greatest moment that our community enjoys. You now, it, it's one of the very best means that the Lord has given to us to parent our covenant children. I want you to think with me uh, through the scriptures, and children are always included, have always been included in this corporate meeting of God's people. I just chose a few this morning, just walked through a few with you, just to give you a sampling. Uh, Joel 2 comes to mind. It is, uh, you know Joel 2. Uh, it will be quoted by Peter, uh, I mean, by uh, yeah, by Peter there at Pentecost, where the Spirit is being poured out, and there in Joel 2, Joel declares this. He says, yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. And then he reassures the people as he is preaching to them that the Lord, their God, he says, is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And and by quoting that, he's quoting uh, what is said of God there in Exodus 34, that great moment with Moses. And so he's reasserting that God is a covenant-keeping God. And he's reminding the nation of Israel that they are the covenant people of God, even as he states this. And then he goes on, and he charges them with this. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people. He's calling them to repentance and to faith. And as he's doing so, he's saying, look, gather the entire community of God's people. Blow the trumpet. Gather them all together. Well, who? Who are they to gather together? Just the elders? Just the priests? Just the men, just the adults. No, Joel says this, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. When he calls the covenant people of God together to a moment of repentance and faithfulness and worship. He's calling together everyone, including nursing infants. Why? Because they're part of the covenant community. If we were to go to some other scriptures, uh, think of Exodus 12 and Moses there giving instruction about the Passover. And he says this as they're celebrating the Passover. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say it's a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck down the Egyptians, uh, but spared our house. That is, children were there at the Passover meal. And the expectation was, is as they're there at the Passover meal, that they will ask questions about the Passover. And parents will be able to instruct their children. We see the same in Exodus 13 as he talks about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In Deuteronomy 16, we see that at the Feast of Weeks, this command is given to the Israelite nation, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your towns, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are among you, at the place where the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. That is, the whole nation is to gather together. The entire covenant people of God, including your sons and your daughters. The, the covenant people of God, the church, when it gathers together, it gathers together 
with all of its people to worship God. And so we are to do so with our children. And there are great blessings and great benefits that come from doing that. Now, listen, I understand uh, it feels like a kind of self-inflicted torture uh, to do this on Sunday mornings at times, to bring your children into corporate worship. And if you don't have children, uh, it feels like others are inflicting torture on you, around you, as their children are in the worship service. But it is worth it. It's worth it as parents. It's worth it as a congregation. Uh, it's worth it for our children. It's worth it for us. And I want to walk through some of the blessings and some of the benefits of having them in the room together with uh, the church as it's worshiping, as they are members of the church. The first is that they will sit in the midst of the word preached. I have to remember, you and I have to remind ourselves that God, he ministers by his means. And the means that he is primarily appointed to minister grace to us is the word, the sacraments, and prayer. And that word preached, when it is preached, it, it does not return void. As Isaiah says, this is a word that, as the writer of Hebrews says, is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it accomplishes its purpose. So its purposes. So, as our children sit underneath the Word of God preached, there is great blessing to them. It's a blessing that can't be received in any other place. There is something unique about when God's people are gathered together as a community where all the gifts of the Spirit are present. And someone who is ordained and been called by God opens that word and preaches and that word to the congregation where we are worshiping in spirit and in truth. There is an effectualness in that that can't be discounted. And placing our children underneath that and in the midst of that is one of the very best things that we can do for their soul. So as they're brought into corporate worship, we're bringing them in to the midst of grace. Now, let's give two cautions as we talk about bringing our children into corporate worship. We can overpromise and we can underpromise. So it's not as if bringing our children into corporate worship is a promise that they will come to saving faith. I think sometimes that is overpromised. Look, we, we need to have our children in corporate worship so that way they will come to salvation. Well, it can be the means that God uses. Uh, it is fertile ground for that occurring. But it's not a promise as if it's a guarantee that if we have our children in corporate worship 52 weeks a year for 18 years as they're in our homes, that they will come to saving faith. But we can also under promise. We can take it as if corporate worship, well, that's a nice add-on. That's something we can add to Sunday school and something we can add on to vacation Bible school. And if it works for our family, it works. If it works for our congregation, it works. No, it's not an add-on, because it's there that the Spirit is especially working amidst the people of God and is shaping and forming them, and they are shaping and forming one another by that same Spirit. And so it's not a simple add-on. So we place our children in the midst of that word that is preached. Second is that as they're there, they see the sacraments, right? This is what you're seeing there in the Passover is that that child is sitting there in Exodus 12 and is asking its father, well, what does this mean? And the father gets the opportunity to explain it. Our, our children, as they see the waters of baptism, I love it, especially on Sunday mornings when we're baptizing uh, an infant in our midst, you will see small children, they, they immediately sit up and they perk up. There's another child up there. 
And it's often on the way home, they, they will ask, this, they will ask, was I, was I baptized like that? And then you get a wonderful opportunity. Yes, you sure were. The, the waters of baptism were put over your head. And you know what? Pastor Jason did that for you or Pastor Kevin did that for you. And let me tell you what that means. And you get the opportunity to share with them that this points to the shed blood of Christ, that this points to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that this points to the fact that they are members of the church, that they need to express faith that their baptism is calling out to them right now. Believe, believe. They get to see the sacraments. They get to see that, you know, what as the bread and the wine come, that they're not getting to participate. Why? Why don't I get to eat and drink? Oh, I want you to eat and drink, son or daughter. And, you know, this is for those that have professed faith in Christ that they've gone before the elders of our church and the elders have sat with them and they've told the elders how they have believed upon Jesus for their salvation, that they've trusted in him alone for their salvation. And I can't wait for the day when you're eating and drinking with us at the table. Do you believe that Jesus is the son of God and that he died for sinners? Did he die for you? Do you believe and trust in him alone for salvation? Just those opportunities. They sit under the word preach. They see the sacraments. They get to participate in prayer. That They are participating in that prayer. They're hearing it. They're even Times, I love it. We have a prayer meeting monthly here at URC. Sunday evenings, we take one of our Sunday evening services and turn it into a prayer meeting. And it is one of the great joys of mine is that we have children in there. And some of these children are brave enough to say prayer out loud in front of all the rest of the adults. And it is music to my ears. And I know it is music to God's ears. I remember years ago, my son, we were talking about prayer, and I was trying to teach him that, listen, when somebody's praying in a worship service up front, I want you to be thinking along with them. And so you're praying with them as they're saying things. And I said, you know, one of the best ways to do that is that as they're praying something, you say in your head, amen. Because amen means verily, truly, that is, I agree with this. And so I said, a good way to do this is when they're praying and you agree with something that they say, you can say in your head, amen. And so I was watching him the weeks after that. And for weeks and weeks after that, I would watch him as a, as a little boy, a four-year-old, five-year-old. I'd watch him while someone was praying up front and he was sitting there with his eyes closed and you would see him go, Amen, over and over and over uh, throughout the prayer. They're in the midst of the, God, the people of God praying. They're participating in prayer. Next, they're present in the midst of the entire congregation. We said this last time, there is no Lone Ranger Christianity. There's not even a Lone Ranger in Tonto Christianity. Uh, there is great benefit to the fact that the Lord God has put us together as a community of faith, and we inform one another. And so your children being in corporate worship, they're seeing the old seasoned saint over there who has lived for 75 years professing Christ or 85 years professing Christ, and it encourages faith in them or encourages their faith. You have a, a teenage son or daughter that thinks that you know nothing but they respect that man or that woman on the other side of the congregation. And they see them singing with a full voice. And they see them praying. And they see them intent on listening to the sermon. And the reverse is also true. There are great benefits to the rest of us as we watch others in the community of faith. And I want to talk about that 
a little later here this morning. Next, they're present with their parents. Uh, our children are going to learn from us more than anything else or from anyone else. And so in corporate worship, our children are sitting next to us. They're sitting by us and they're watching us worship God. And it's informing their faith. It's informing their lives. We are evangelists for the things that we most love. I, I was at a, um, there was a group of, parents of, of fathers that uh, I participated with a number of years ago, we were doing an NFL a fantasy football league. And there was a draft night where we were going to draft our players. And I showed up at this with my son. It was a father-son thing. So we were supposed to do it with our sons. And so I show up at this house and uh, I walked in and sat down with the rest of the fathers and sons. And I was looking around the room and what was fascinating to me was that almost every father and son were wearing the same team's hat on their head. So this team, this family over here, the father and son were wearing the Dallas Cowboys, both of them. Over here, the father and son, they were both wearing Chicago Bears hats. Over here, father and son, they were both wearing Green Bay Packer hats. What, what happened there? Well, it's that the father was an evangelist for what he loved. And so his son began rooting for the team that his father loved. When our children are with us in corporate worship, there is an evangelistic occurrence that's happening, not only in the word that's being preached, not only in what they're hearing, but also in what they are seeing in our lives. We're evangelists for what we most love. There's a benefit to them being with us in corporate worship because of that. Next, it demonstrates our weekly priority. It shows our children that this is what we value among uh, above everything else in what we're doing week in and week out, that we gather together with God's people in the midst of God's people, and this is what we do as a family. This is what we do together. It's not lost in our children when they're attending corporate worship week in and week out that we are a church-going, worshiping family. And that informs that there is a, a routineness that begins to inform. And that informs spiritual lives. Next, it also has the benefit of passing on the story. We looked at that at Psalm 78 last week, that we are to pass on the story. And our children begin to grasp the story more and more as they sit and worship week in and week out. That it's the story that they're hearing, this great redemptive story from, from the Garden of Eden to the return of Christ. They are they are sitting underneath the story, but they're not just sitting underneath the telling of the story. They're participating in the story. And there's great benefit to that. For them beginning to see themselves as, as participants, as actors in this great redemptive story. And they're doing that as they participate in corporate worship. Remember, uh, the first church I served, uh, there was I was in charge of all the children's ministries and youth ministry and family ministries. And so there was a, I would take different Sundays and I would go to different Sunday school classes and listen to the teachers and just interact with the children. And uh, I went to a, a kindergarten class one day, one of the best teachers in this church. She was 75 years old and the kids adored her and she taught them Oh, so well. But this kindergarten class, they were, the teacher asked, a 75-year-old teacher, she asked the kindergartners, she asked, does anyone know the, the story of, of Eli and Samuel? And uh, one of the little boys raised his hand. And his name was Sam. And she said, well, Sam, you know this story. And he said, yes. And he just began telling it. And that wonderful account where 
The Lord God in the middle of the night has seen Samuel. Samuel. And Samuel will get up and think it's Eli calling him. And this, this five-year-old boy, he, he literally took probably eight minutes to tell the story. And he told it dramatically. And uh, he'd say, Samuel, Samuel. And he got done with it. And this teacher, Mrs. Garwood, uh, she said, she said, Sam, how, how do you know this story so well? And without a pause, he said, because it's about me. <laughs> and he saw himself as Samuel and because he's named after him. And uh, it's, it's not quite that, that our children are seeing themselves as uh, as different people in this redemptive story, but, but Samuel had the right idea that we're participants in this story, that we are operating in this grand redemptive story. We are characters in it in the best sense of the word. Some of us are characters in other sense, but we are characters in this story where God is fulfilling his purposes in this world and we're participating in it. And our children are witnessing that and experiencing that in corporate worship. It engages our children in that. Uh, it makes a statement to our children. When we include children in worship, we're saying to them, you're part of the church. When we don't have them in corporate worship, we're saying that we're, we're communicating something to them. It may be that they don't quite belong to the church. I definitely think we're saying to them they can't quite grasp what is happening in worship. And in a subtle way, we're communicating to them that this is an adult faith. This is Christianity is an adult thing. And you can begin to understand it and participate in it and believe in it when you get to an older age. And, and that is... That is not good parenting on our parts. We want our children to know that this is a faith for all. That you're not excluded, not only by race or gender or ethnicity or nationality, but you're not excluded by age. Jesus says, let the little children come to me. You remember when the, the disciples in that moment where parents are bringing small children Small children is what we're told, infants. And they're reaching them out to Jesus and asking Jesus to take them and bless them. You remember the disciples are trying to, to push these parents and children away. And Mark will use this language. He will say that Jesus was indignant. Very few times you see Jesus indignant or angry in the Gospels. And he is indignant. He's angry. He's angry with the disciples. Why? Because they're trying to exclude children from coming to him. When these parents are just seeking to put their children in the arms of Jesus so that Jesus might bless them. We're to, we're to put our children in the way of Christ's blessing. He says, let the little children come to me. And so we do that as we make a statement to them and have them enter into our corporate worship. The other, though, is I want to flip this for a second and say there's also a great benefit to us, to us as adults, to older people in the congregation. Jesus speaks about children being an example to us. In Mark 10, he says this, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. In Christ's eyes, children are not a distraction. They're not a distraction. They're an example. And so as children participate in corporate worship, it has, we not only influence them, but they're influencing us. You and I are, are prodded to have a simple faith like theirs, to have that simple trusting faith in Christ like they often do, to have joy in singing as they do. I remember a church I used to go to, and 
and preach at a church plant uh, for years uh, just to assist them. Their pastor was you know, doing it by himself. So every five weeks I would go just to relieve him so he could have a little bit of a break. And so I would go and preach. And they had this girl in the congregation that was seven or so years old. And small congregation, a church plant, you know, 40, 50 people. Uh, and she would sing at the top of her lungs. And she could not hold a tune to save her life. But she would sing at the top of her lungs. And every time I would go, I would just smile. I, I couldn't help. There were times I'd have to stop singing because I couldn't stop smiling so much. Because it was it was a joyful noise, and it was a noise, but it was so joy-filled. She loved the Lord, and she loved singing to him. And that informed my faith. That encouraged my faith. That you know what? This faith isn't disappearing with my generation, because that, that little girl, she's going to carry it forward. They set an example before us, and they influence us even as we influence them. All right, let me just give you some practical things, just quickly at the end here, just some practical help for parents, just some wisdom for how you do this. First, treasure the Lord's Day. If you treasure the Lord's Day as a parent, your children will treasure the Lord's Day. If you are a reluctant worshiper, they will be a reluctant worshiper. If you leave each service complaining about the preacher or complaining about the songs or wishing that things had been different, that's your conversation on the way home, they will feel the same way about worship. But if you rise on Sunday morning and you're excited and you make this very clearly to your family that this is, this is the high point of our week and, oh, it is such a blessing that we get to go and worship with the living God this morning and worship with his people your children will treasure the Lord's day. So set the example. Prepare appropriately. A tired children and tired parents create fertile ground for cranky worshipers. So Saturday night, uh, do family worship with your family. Prepare for the Lord's day the next day. Don't stay up late. Uh, prepare. For the next day, prepare appropriately. On Sunday morning, oh, so many families make the mistake of they are rushing, they're hustling, they're bustling, they barely get out the door. Uh, every Sunday they arrive 10 minutes late. Listen, if you can be consistently 10 minutes late every Sunday morning, you can be consistently 10 minutes early every Sunday morning. Prepare appropriately. Lay out the clothes early in the morning. Get up early. Have your children get up early enough so that you're not rushing out the door, so that you're not having to go 60 miles per hour down the road to church when it's a 30 mile per hour zone and everybody is frantic and everybody is rushing into worship and it just feels like this discombobulated mess. Prepare appropriately. Start early. Many believe it's more challenging to bring children into worship when they're young rather than when they're older, and the reverse is true. Uh, a three-year-old is not set in their ways yet. And so if you can do this battle, and it's battle, let's just be honest, it's a struggle early, and there are going to be months where it feels like you've gotten nothing out of corporate worship because you've been bringing your child in, and they become disruptive, and you have to walk out, and you have to discipline them and speak to them and then bring them back in and you feel like you're constantly mediating between the children in the pew and it feels like months where they haven't worshipped you haven't worshipped but those months are well spent they're well spent because if you can lay the seeds in the groundwork when they're younger then you have a decade and more for them to sit and worship and to be absorbing more and more of what's happening in worship. But don't think that just in that wrestling that everybody is losing out, that there are blessings that are, that are accruing. You, you never know. Again, that word does not return void. So you never know what they're grasping. 
You never know what moment in a servant's is going to influence them and put a stamp upon their life for all of eternity. It is time well spent. So start early, do it early, form them as pew sitters and worshipers early, and it will pay dividends in the long run. Teach the songs would be another piece of advice I would give to you. You can do this. It's so easy today. You can use YouTube. You can get uh, digital downloads of the music that you're going to sing on Sunday morning. Uh, you know, the Trinity hymnal and Psalter, all of those songs are out there online. Teach the songs to your children. That's one of the first places that they will find a connecting point in worship if they know the songs. So take some of the songs that you most often sing as a church and begin singing them together at home or play them while you're washing dishes together as a family or as you're playing a board game together as a family and just sow the words in their head. And when those songs come, they will just erupt in singing them. So teach the songs. Use moments in the service. Uh, I used to do this, especially when they were younger, is that when there was a transition in the service, I might lean over and whisper in my son or daughter's ear, oh, wasn't that a great song we just sang? Or I might uh, whisper in their ear, oh, that's one of my favorite verses in the Bible that we just heard. I mean, just using moments in the service to, to help them connect and to reflect upon what's just happened or what's getting ready to happen. Make it special. Make it special. Our children, especially when they're young, they love to be with us. So make it special. Uh, take a small child and sit them upon your lap and put your arms around them and embrace them. They, they love to sit on mommy or daddy's lap. And so make that moment special in worship. Let them sit next to you and, and, and lean upon you. Uh, make it special that there's closeness here as we gather in corporate worship. Employ the obvious helps that there are. Uh, we often forget to employ the help that already exists. So have an older child, when you sit down, ask them if they would help you, if they would find the Bible passage that's going to be preached that morning. I remember as a small child, my, my mom, uh, I used to love for my mom and grandma getting the hymnal out and and taking pieces of paper and finding every hymn that we we're going to sing and putting bookmarks in there for them. Use the helps that already exist. Employ those and, and have your children do some of those things. Some of you are single parents. Uh, even if you're not a single parent, I often encourage this among uh, dual parents. Uh, enlist other members to help you. Uh, when I was a church planter, my dear wife uh, wrestled with our children in uh, the chairs because there were no pews in our church plant while well, I'm up front leading the service. And it was it was brutal for her as a functioning single parent and in the congregation. And there was a, a dear lady in the congregation that came alongside my wife and would sit next to her week after week. And she would help man the children. Uh, ask. Ask someone to help you. Teenage girls love this in a church, to be asked, would you be willing to sit with our family every other week and then get another teenage girl to do it? Just to sit and your children will love it that there's a teenage girl sitting there that's just helping to man them and helping to keep them quiet and keep them engaged in the service or enlist the support of others. Encourage active participation. Encourage your children. If the congregation stands, they stand. If the congregation sits, they sit. If we're singing, they sing. If we open the Bible, they are to open a Bible on their lap and they're to look at that passage. Help them to engage. And in that way, be consistent. Don't let your children doodle one week and then tell them they can't doodle the next week. Be consistent. Whatever works for your family. I have a a son that it was not helpful for him to doodle during the sermon uh, because he heard nothing. And I have a daughter, though, that if she's not doing something with her hands, then she can't listen. And so we had to have different rules for our different children and walk that through with them. Grayson, you can doodle a little bit during the sermon. 
uh, but you have to be drawing things that connect with what is being preached. Ethan, you can't doodle. No doodling. Uh, and just walk that through with your children. Uh, but be consistent in what works for them and what works for your family. Just a couple more. Help them to get to know the pastor. Oh, this is so important. Uh, introduce them to the pastor. Have them come up to the pastor regularly. I have uh, different children here in the congregation that come up and just grab a hold of my le leg and give me a hug, and I love it. Um, I know a pastor that used to have candy in his pocket all the time so that any child that came up and recited a verse to him, he would give a, a piece of candy, and it just makes that connection. Um, make connections with the pastor between the pastor and your children, and, and you're going to have to do it as parents. Uh, it's hard as a pastor to get to every single family in a congregation, especially the size of Christ's covenant. Uh, so get your children in front of the pastor so that uh, they feel like they know him. And so when he gets up to stand up to preach, uh, they will listen more. Those are just a few helps. Uh, maybe one more uh, before I close us here in prayer is talk about it on the way home. Did you talk about it with your children on the way home? Talk about uh, what you benefited from in the sermon how you were challenged, or what song moved your heart, or what encouraged you. That is so important. So often, as, as they often say, we have, we have a, a cooked pastor for lunch. You know, you, you, you're roasting the pastor over lunch. Don't do that. On the way home and over lunch, after you've come home from worship, talk about how you were challenged or how you were encouraged, or what new delight you found in Christ, or what new thought you had about your Savior. And in the pew, in the pew, stop worrying. Stop worrying. Listen, our children have to adjust. So there's going to be some times we have to take them out of the service, um, especially early. It's going to have to happen quite a bit, and then we'll have to bring them back in. But listen, a little rustling of papers, a fidgety kid in the pew, uh, stop worrying about it. It's louder to you than it is to the people around you. Uh, the adults around you need to adjust even as your children need to adjust. And they need to learn to do that as well. I often will tell people, listen, I, I know you can do this because I've been in some of your homes and your wife is in there washing dishes and banging pots and pans, and you're sitting in front of a football game on Sunday afternoon, and she says something to you, and you don't hear a word she says because you're focused on the football game. Adults can adjust. They can adjust and stay focused upon what's happening in corporate worship, even with some rustling of papers and even with some fidgety kids. And it's actually a benefit to all of us to have them in there doing that. So keep at it. Keep laboring at it. Be patient with your children. Be patient with yourself. Be patient with children if they're not yours in the sanctuary. If they become disruptive, take them out. But a little rustling is not a bad thing. It's worth it. It's worth it for their souls. It's worth it for our souls. It's worth it for the glory of God. So include your children in corporate worship as much as you can. Ah, Christ's covenant has been such a blessing to be with you. Uh, a delight. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I hope to worship with you sometime soon. All right. Blessings to you. We'll talk to you later.